Welcome to Worship Online at the Wiper Lake United Methodist Church. I'm Pastor John McBride, and together with Pastor Bill Eves, we want to thank you for joining us today. It's been quite a week, hasn't it? For so many of us, it has felt like an emotional roller coaster, from anticipation and fear to relief. I'm sure many of you are like me. I need to be nourished, both spiritually and emotionally. It is our mission to provide nourishment for the hungers of life. Today, as we worship together, let's ask God to nourish us, to renew our faith, and guide us into bringing healing and wholeness to our broken community. Let's be in worship together. Ida B. Wells was a pioneering African-American journalist in the 1890s. Born an enslaved person in Holly Springs, Mississippi in 1862, she was declared a free person by the Emancipation Proclamation later that year. She was raised in a Methodist family, attended school until the age of 16, and then moved to Memphis where she began writing for several local black newspapers. A turning point came on a train ride from Memphis to Nashville when she bought a first class ticket but was refused a seat in first class because she was black. She sued the railroad and won a settlement of $500 but the judgment was overturned by the Tennessee Supreme Court. Working as a journalist, she became a vocal critic of the condition of black schools in the city. A lynching that occurred in Memphis in 1892 led her to begin an anti-lynching campaign. These public mob executions were meant to instill fear in black citizens. After writing about lynchings in Memphis, her office was stormed and the newspaper equipment was destroyed. She was on her way to New York City at the time and was warned never to return. So she settled in New York and began writing for a black newspaper there. In the years that followed, she used the tools of investigative journalism to educate people about the practice of lynching, documenting over 4,000 of them. She married attorney Ferdinand Barnett and had six children. And in later years, she became a co-founder of the NAACP. Her pen was the instrument of her resistance against racist hatred. She wrote, the way to right wrongs is to turn the light of truth on them. Ida B. Wells Barnett, an example of righteous resistance against wrong. Sansa Mokum was born in 1723. 
He was a member of the Mohican Lation near present-day New London, Connecticut. At the age of 16 or 17, Oakham heard the teachings of Christian preachers and began to study theology at the Latin School of Congregational Minister Eleazar Wheelock in 1743. He stayed with Wheelock for four years until leaving to find his own way in life. In addition to improving his English, Oakham learned to read and speak Latin, Greek, and Hebrew. As a young man, the only book he owned was the Bible. Wheelock eventually persuaded his formal pupil to travel to England to raise money for a school that Oakham believed would benefit young Indian men. He sailed from Boston in December of 1765 and didn't return until May of 1768. Oakham preached his way across Britain from February 16, 1766 to July 22, 1767 delivering between 300 and 400 sermons, drawing large crowds wherever he went, and raising over 12,000 12, pounds for Wheelock's school project. Along the way, he even had an audience with King George III, who donated 200 pounds to the cause. After raising all this money on his return, Oakham learned that Wheelock had failed to keep his promise to take care of his wife and children while he was away. He also discovered that Wheelock had moved to New Hampshire and used all the funds that Oakham had raised to establish Dartmouth College, not for the education of Native Americans, but for those of European descent. Even 200 years later, the college has graduated less than 20 Native American students. After Wheelock's betrayal, Oakham came to realize that he could no longer trust these European immigrants and began to organize the Christian Indians of New England and Long Island into a new tribe, the Brotherton tribe, which settled in upstate New York. Their settlement was burnt to the ground at the outset of the Revolutionary War. So the Brotherton moved to Massachusetts to live among the Stockbridge until their return to New York in 1785. After Oakham's death during the 1820s, the Brothertown Indians were removed from New York to Wisconsin. But not long after that, as part of the Indian removal process, they were told they would have to relocate to Kansas. Brothertown resisted and asked that they be made citizens and own their own land like white citizens. This was agreed to, but they didn't understand, and they weren't told that they would be required to now pay taxes on the land. Much of their land was lost to tax forfeiture over time. In more recent years, the people of the Brotherton discovered that by accepting citizenship before the Citizenship Act of 1924, which made all Native Americans American citizens, they had forfeited all the benefits enjoyed by the tribes that had moved to a reservation. So the Brotherton Indians petitioned the federal government for recognition as a tribe, but that was denied. But you know, Samson Oakham and the people of Brothertown are not the only victims of European immigration. Unfortunately, we either failed to learn or we have forgotten Prior to 1492, there were over 500 nations with tens of millions of people living in North America. There were over 300 different languages spoken among these nations. If you viewed a map, a time-lapse map of, of languages, you would see that they would disappear off the map, one after another after another, starting in the east and slowly moving to the west as those European descendants began to migrate across the continent. In 1830, after two treaties with the Cherokee Nation were broken by the United States government, then President Andrew Jackson pushed through the Indian Removal Act, which forced five nations to be relocated to the southeast Oklahoma. The Cherokee, Creek, Seminole, Chickasaw, and Choctaw people were all forced to leave their homeland, 
some driven by 7,000 American troops, which were sent to speed up the process. During this forced migration of over 100,000 human beings, they were forced to move to a strange land. They did so by force and with the false promise of a permanent Indian territory west of the Mississippi. Along the way, it is estimated that more than 5,000 Cherokee and 3,500 Creek died. That process is known as the Trail of Tears. When I consider all this history, I find myself wondering, how did these European immigrants and their descendants justify their actions? especially when you consider that they professed to be Christians. Despite what we may have come to believe through the cowboy and Indian movies of our youth, these 500 nations of people whose lands were taken by the European interlopers wasn't taken by military force. All the wars, the massacres, the genocide and the cultural genocide that is part of our American history was really just clean up. The real conquest was on paper, on maps, broken treaties, broken promises, and in laws. And what those maps showed and those laws said was that the Indians had been conquered merely by being discovered. Chief Justice John Marshall, in a famous Supreme Court case, of John Johnson versus McIntosh established what has been come to known as the discovery doctrine. The case Johnson says that by virtue of discovery, the Europeans and by succession, the Americans have dominion and sovereignty over native peoples, their lands and their governments. Under this doctrine, this new world that Columbus happened upon was legally vacant. Title to all of the Indian land is, is then held by the discoverer. And Indian people are subject to the overriding political sovereignty of the discoverer. How was this justified? These are Chief Justice Marshall's words. The character and religion of the new world's inhabitants afforded an apology for considering them as people over whom the superior genius of Europe might claim an ascendancy. To leave them in possession of their land was to leave the country a wilderness. He went on, agriculturalists, merchants and manufacturers have a right on abstract principles to expel hunters from their territory. He also said excuse, if not justification, could be found in the character and habits of the peoples whose rights have been wrestled from them. And the last one, the potentates of the old world made ample compensation to the inhabitants of the new world by bestowing upon them civilization and Christianity. Those two things, civilization and Christianity justified the taking of an entire continent this discovery doctrine existed in Europe long before John Marshall put it into law in the United States. It had been used by kings and the church to justify the disposition of indigenous peoples around the world. In 1492, when the Christian kings of Europe, in Justice Marshall's words, conducted some of their adventurous sons into the Western world, they believed as a religious matter or whatever they found belonged to them. Whether it be kings, emperors, democratically elected authoritarians, or those that support them and benefit from their power, the decimation of other nations, races, cultures, and language was justified by the belief that those with power were superior to those without power, that those without power were less human than those in power. And they use the Bible, in this case, the books of Exodus and Joshua to justify their action. 
like those who tried to justify slavery with scripture. They cherry-picked and distorted verses while ignoring volumes of the Bible which call for justice, equality, and dignity for all people, including the very first book which proclaims that all people, not just some, are made in the image of God. For them, it was only the discoverer and conqueror who imaged God, not the conquered. But as Pastor Bill suggested last week, the Bible is a book of resistance. The words and stories in it make up a handbook for God's resistance movement against everything that diminishes life or negates who God created us to be or stands in a way of the well-being of people, the thriving and the flourishing of all of us. Listen to this verse from 1 Samuel chapter 8, verses 1 through 7. When Samuel became old, he made his sons judges over Israel. The name of his firstborn son was Joel, and the name of his second, Abijah. They were judges in Beersheba. Yet his sons did not follow in his ways, but turned aside after gain. They took bribes and perverted justice. Then all the elders of Israel gathered together and came to Samuel at Ramah and said to him, You are old, and your sons do not follow in your ways. Appoint for us then a king to govern us like other nations. But the thing displeased Samuel when they said, Give us a king to govern us. Samuel prayed to the Lord, and the Lord said to Samuel, Listen to the voice of the people in all that they say to you, for they have not rejected you, but they have rejected me from being king over them. Up to the time of this passage, over 3,000 years ago, Israel had never been ruled by a king. Rather, they relied upon judges who would apply God's law, God's justice, God's rule through the people. Samuel had appointed his two sons to serve as judges, but they were corrupt. Rather than ask Samuel for judges who were not corrupt, the people looked around at other nations that surrounded them, and they decided they wanted to be ruled not by God's justice, but by a, a human king. As you can see from the passage that Lori just read, God said to Samuel, listen to the voice of the people. They've not rejected you, but they have rejected me from being king over them. So Samuel tells the people that he will do what they asked, but warn them in a way that is so true to this day. This is what Samuel said, these will be the ways of the king who will reign over you. He will take your sons and appoint them to his chariots and to his horsemen and to run before his chariots. He will appoint for himself commanders of thousands and commanders of fifties and some to plow his ground and to reap his harvest and to make his implements of war and the equipment of his chariots. He will take your daughters to be perfumers and cooks and bakers. He will take the best of your fields and vineyards and olive orchards and give them to his courtiers. He will take one-tenth of your grain and of your vineyards and, and give it to his officers and his courtiers. He will take the best of your cattle and donkeys and put them to his work. And he will take one-tenth of your flock and you shall be his slave. Six times the phrase, he will take, is used in God's warning to the people. What do kings, tyrants, strong men, and authoritarian leaders do? They design a system that exploits everyone's treasure for them and their circle. They see those over whom they have power as less than human and treat them as less than human. They can take the land, the culture, the very lives of those who get in the way and justify it by distorting Holy Scripture. 
the law prior to the Israelites getting their king, laid out a legal framework that repudiated slavery, welcomed foreigners, refugees, provided for the poor, and prevented entrenched inequality. The Israelites had forgotten their own story. Theirs was a story of oppression, but more importantly, theirs was a story of resistance, of having placed their faith in God and in God's justice, which liberated them from slavery and oppression. When power is taken away from God and given to those who will abuse it, they reject the democratic rules of the game, often by subtle methods like canceling or undermining the legitimacy of elections. Through redistricting, voter suppression, banning opposition organizations, closing polling places, losing ballots, or restricting civil rights. They deny the legitimacy of political opponents. They encourage violence and are ready to curtail civil liberties of opponents, including the press. They create fear and turn fear into hate for the other. They treat everyone outside their circle as less than human, rather than as a child of God. And in a democracy like ours, they believe they are above the law, not subject to it. In the past year, it seems we have seen so many examples of this abuse of power that God warns us of. One of those examples played out for nine minutes and 29 seconds last May 25th as a Minneapolis police officer, given the power of the badge, knelt on the neck of George Floyd and murdered him defiantly staring at the black citizens who pleaded for him to stop and recorded George Floyd's death. What Derek Chauvin didn't count on. Unlike the Israelites over 3,000 years ago, the black community was unwilling to forget the past and resist it, insisting while black lives didn't matter through much of our American history, black lives do matter. Black lives have always mattered because black lives are human lives, children of God made in the image of God. Chauvin, as he had his knee on George Floyd's neck, rejected that truth. He saw George and all those begging him to stop as less than human, not as beloved children of God. But as, George, as James Baldwin puts it so eloquently, please try to remember that what they believe, as well as what they do and cause you to endure, does not testify to your inferiority, but to their inhumanity. And now there will be accountability for that inhumanity. The Brotherton, the Brotherton community have not forgotten their history either. As I mentioned earlier, they had petitioned to be recognized by the federal government as a, an Indian nation once again. When the petition was denied, my colleague, Jessica Ryan, was nine years old. His mother, her mother, a member of the Brotherton Nation, had worked diligently to advance that petition she remembers her mother's tears when the petition was rejected. Shortly after that, at school, nine-year-old Jessica was asked, along with the rest of the class, what she wanted to be when she grew up. She didn't hesitate. I want to be a lawyer. I want to be a lawyer. So she could continue the resistance and fight for her people. Today, as a lawyer, and a tribal judge, that resistance continues. God calls us to remember where we and others have come from and to have historical empathy. In other words, as people of faith, we must examine history from the reality of those who are at the bottom of the power pyramid. Although I personally didn't do these things, I, I still benefit even today, 
I owe a debt that can never fully be repaid, but one I need to address by being willing to let go of my privilege. God gave us the spiritual discipline of remembrance to interrupt the dangerous slide into authoritarianism and corruption of power. If we don't remember who and whose we are, who really has the power, who really has the way, we are destined to repeat the same mistakes over and over again. I don't know about you, but I'm tired of repeating history. I'm ready to let God be the power again. Today I invite you to pray silently as you're prompted by the words and the images. Let us pray. Begin by praying in silence for a worry or concern that has been weighing on you. Pray for our church. Pray for your community and your neighborhood Pray for an end to the pain and the hurt in our country and in our community. Pray for your family and friends near and far. Pray for people who are sick or struggling. Pray for guidance and wisdom for a decision you're facing. Take a moment and give thanks for the blessings in your life. You might say them out loud. And join me now as we pray together as Jesus taught us. Our Father who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, and the power, and the glory, forever. Amen. Thank you for joining us in worship today. We're, we're so pleased you could make it. 
we would like to stay connected with you, so I invite you to check out our website at wblumc.org or follow us on Facebook. As I mentioned during the message, there will be accountability and have been accountability for in humanity. But that accountability doesn't take away the brokenness, the brokenness of the Floyd family, the brokenness of our brothers and sisters in the black community, the brokenness of our entire community, the brokenness of Mr. Chauvin's family and his own. As we go from this time of worship, let's go out and be instruments of peace, instruments of healing brokenness rather than instruments of division. And know wherever you go, God is there, surrounding you with mercy and guiding you with love. So go seeing, speaking, listening, knowing and doing, knowing that God is always with you. Amen. Systems bruised and bleeding.